Hi, I'm Grant, and I'm a master's student in statistics at UC Santa Cruz. This summer, I've been working with Jim Gattaker and Natalie Klein in CCS6. They've been hard at work building Sepia, an open source Python code for simulation supported science. My project has had two parts, learning the methodology in order to implement examples for both code validation and to help new users, as well as assisting with new analysis problems. This talk will illustrate the power of sepia through a simple physics example. We will learn about atmospheric drag by simulating balls falling from a tower. As is so often our motivation here at the lab, our goal is to learn about complex physical systems. We want to understand physical parameters and quantify their uncertainty. Experimental and simulation data are often scarce due to cost and complexity. This is where our methods truly shine. Regression techniques are used to create fast statistical emulators which can replace these expensive simulations. Sepia is an open source Python code that uses physics-informed machine learning to accomplish this. Sepia is being developed as a port from the MATLAB code GPMSA, which has been used by CCS6 for many publications. I'll give an overview of the methodology here using our atmospheric drag example. If you're interested in a more in-depth demonstration of the method, see Higdon et al. in the references where an imploding cylinder is modeled using GPMSA. So how will Sepia teach us about atmospheric drag? Sepia fits Gaussian process emulators to simulation data and uses them to learn the parameter values that most closely reproduce experimental data. One of the most important features of Sepia is the ability to make predictions at untried experimental design settings with quantified uncertainty. The example we're looking at today is very simple, but illustrates Sepia's ability to calibrate parameters. Suppose we drop three balls of differing radius from a tall tower and record the time at height intervals as they fall. Sadly, we didn't actually get to do these experiments so we generate synthetic experimental data from the ODE in equation 1. We use c equal to 0.1, the coefficient of drag for a smooth sphere. Our simulation data is then produced from equation 2 using many different values of c. You can see that the simulation data will be inherently biased from the experimental data. The velocity term in equation 2 is linear rather than quadratic. We purposefully designed our example in this way to highlight an important and common theme in simulation-based physics. Simulations often differ from reality. This could be due to missing physics or approximations in the simulations. I'll demonstrate how Sepia can account for this difference. Here, we generate experimental data directly from an equation. But in a real application, equation one would be unknown, and we would attempt to learn it by making experimental observations. So our goal is to learn the value of C that is most consistent with the observed data and to characterize how the simulations differ from experiment. Our statistical model will consist of two Gaussian processes, an emulator for estimated simulation output and another for discrepancy, the difference between simulation and reality. Adding the discrepancy model to the simulation emulator should get us closer to reality than emulator alone. For this example, we take the coefficient of gravity and radius of the ball to be known, and let C, the coefficient of drag, be the parameter we wish to learn. So I've said that we want to learn C. What do I actually mean by that? Suppose we set up the tower example with little to no information about C. We generate 25 simulations with values of C evenly spaced between 0.05 and 0.25. Those simulations are shown in the left plot, and those chosen values of C in the upper left-hand corner. Once Sepia learns C, there's far less uncertainty in its distribution. This new distribution is shown in the upper left corner of the right plot. We can see that this distribution has a nice peak, which is very different from the uniform. We can sample values of C from this distribution and run new simulations. We see that this reduced uncertainty in C has propagated to those simulations, producing results that are constrained to more closely resemble observed data. 
Let's talk a little bit about how CPIA creates emulators and models discrepancy. Following the formulation in Higdon, our physical system looks like equation 3. The observed values y are a function zeta of the controllable experimental conditions x plus observation error epsilon, which could also be dependent on experimental conditions. We approximate the zeta function with an emulator eta and a discrepancy delta. Eta will be dependent on x, as well as unknown simulation parameters theta, which we want to learn. As we've mentioned, simulations will often be significantly different from reality, which is why delta is important. Delta can also be different at every experimental condition x. In the tower example, our experimental conditions are the ball radius, r, and our single parameter of interest is c, the coefficient of drag. Sepia will approximate eta and delta with Gaussian processes, a type of statistical regression method. But we have a computational problem to deal with first. High dimensional output is usually the rule, not the exception, in complex physics problems. This creates computational challenges with Gaussian process. We get around this by using a basis representation for both emulator and discrepancy. By using principal components, we reduce our problem to a mixture of univariate Gaussian processes, which is computationally feasible for a reasonable number of principal components. In our example, we will use principal component analysis for the emulator basis and normal kernel basis vectors for the discrepancy. Normal kernels are nice because they provide a good trade-off between smoothness and flexibility. Plotted here in the lower right is the discrepancy basis before weights are calculated. We have 16 normal kernels centered at equally spaced distances between 0 and 25 meters, with standard deviation equal to the distance between them. In slide 4, we showed two different distributions for C. A uniform distribution from 0.05 to 0.25, which we applied with little to no knowledge of C, and a highly peaked distribution once CPA learned about C. This learned distribution is called a posterior distribution, and it can be derived from Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule says that the posterior distribution is proportional to the likelihood of the data, given the parameter settings, times the prior distribution of the parameters, which in our case was uniform. Gaussian processes are convenient as they lead to friendly likelihood functions. With a likelihood and a prior, we have everything we need to get a posterior with Bayes' rule. We generate samples from this posterior using Markov chain Monte Carlo. You can see a histogram of these samples here. This distribution is actually the same distribution as we showed in slide 4, just zoomed in a bit. Now that we have posterior distributions, we can take samples from them and make predictions. Looking back at our equations from slides 4 and 5, we can add our predicted emulator output to our predicted discrepancy and get complete predictions. The figure on the right shows this process. We make predictions using a thousand posterior samples and show the mean of those predictions in blue. Uncertainty is given in the form of 5 and 95% quantiles. The first panel shows predictions from the emulator. We see that our emulator tends to overpredict when the ball is close to the drop point and underpredict when far away. Remember how our experimental data and simulation data were generated from two different equations? Well, the discrepancy in panel 2 reveals this. Notice that the y scale is different from the top panel, so the discrepancy is pretty small. Third panel shows that emulator plus discrepancy is much better than emulator alone at reproducing the observed data. While our example shows how well sepia can perform in a simple one-parameter setting, we would like to be confident of its performance in a more realistic setting with more parameters. We apply the same methodology to a study of aluminum strength and plasticity. In the bottom left plot, we see that the data consists of four velocity-time pairs. The technical details of the data are beyond the scope of this talk, but it's worthwhile to see the structure. The data was analyzed by Walters et al. using GPMSA. This early result of sepia does a reasonably good job at reproducing the posterior distributions from their analysis. 
The locations of the peaks are consistent, but in the last two distributions, we do see some differences. Our MCMC only produced 10,000 samples, while they did 175,000. This is possibly why some of the peaks in our distributions seem to be more or less explored than theirs. I implemented the ball drop example in early July and have since implemented some other known examples. Now I'm moving on to exploring more novel examples with the rest of my time this summer. I want to give a big thanks to Jim and Natalie for helping me learn the methodology behind sepia. And thank you all for your time.